resume with the session Bharat Mata Ki Jai, where we have Shopun Das Gupta in conversation with Kanchan Gupta. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the inaugural session of uh, this year's Republic Pondi Lit Fest. Uh, the inaugural session is titled Bharat Mata Ki Jai and uh, it is themed around uh, Swapandas Gupta's book Awakening Bharat Mata. It's a two hour session and we have split it into a conversation with the author about the book and after that I will have panelists joining us and we'll sort of widen the discussion on uh, the on their ideas about the book, what they think about the book, about the idea of uh, uh, India as mother and uh, from which stems the idea of Indian nationalism. So the first part is on the book. The second part is about the book and the larger idea behind the book. Uh, welcome, Shopun, for this session. So, Shopun, when you, you know, your book begins with uh, the political context as to what prompted you to write it. And uh, you begin with the 2014 election with its, un you use the term unanticipated result. Between 2014 and 2019, another election has been held. And uh, in 2019, the results were, I wouldn't say unanticipated, but unprecedented, the party alone got such a huge number of seats. And we all know that uh, there was a Modi factor at play, but beyond that, there was something happening, a churn happening in India. And uh, this book essentially tries to capture that churn. Am I right about it? Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to, to this uh, Bondi Literary Festival and honoring me with the inaugural session, which is quite a I guess it's quite an honor. Uh, I would hesitate to sort of, even while the book is structured around the political context to begin with, I think probably the political context is not the principal reason why I decided to write this book. I mean, that's an, in, that's a, uh, maybe it's a bit of a journalistic shorthand to try and get people interested and see what the peg is. And so as we realize about pegs, the pegs can be ephemeral. I wrote it before the 2019 elections had been held. And perforce, therefore, it began with the 2014. If I was to write it now, I'd probably begin with 2019. But it really doesn't make that difference. The reason why I wrote this book, why I addressed some of these concerns, are very simple. And this has got to do with the larger intellectual climate in India. There is a belief, a very strong and a very entrenched belief, that those who are loosely, and I don't like the term, but I'll use the term for again for as a shorthand because it's very easy for people to identify with it. Those who belong to the right are essentially, one, stupid, and two, anti-intellectual. Three, they also have no intellectual pedigree with them. That they are a morass and a collection of prejudices which manifest themselves in different ways. And all of you, in some way or the other, must have come across these uh, assertions at some point. I mean, Sandhya is nodding very vigorously. Um, so probably she's confronted it more robustly than others. But I think that's, I think it, but it's again, it's 
not something which is uniquely Indian. And I think this is what some people should realize this. That the categorization of the right is stupid is not uniquely Indian. The word stupid party was a term which was devised for the conservative party in the United Kingdom. And cons consequently, it became known also as the nasty party. So as you can see, these are analogies which are there all over. So it's not something uniquely Indian. And therefore, so while I might have addressed it in the context of the 2014, and you can extend it to 2019, uh, to try and explain, for instance, why when someone like Narendra Modi starts a political speech, why does he begin it by saying Bharat Mata ki jai? What's the origin of the word? What's the intellectual ancestry of this? And that's why it's, in a sense, fortuitous coincidence, or as Kiran Bedi would say, something else, uh, that we are holding it in Pondi today. Because if there was one person who actually put Bharat Mata as a concept into the Indian imagination, and mind you, the the ancestry of Bharat Mata is not that old. We had a notion of Bharat. We had a notion of Bharat Varsh. But the idea of Bharat Mata was really something which began with Bankim Chandra's deification of Bande Mataram. And Bankim Chandra's deification was popularized and put into the collective national imagination by Sri Aurobindo. So that's the linkage. And that's why this place has a special significance as far as Bharat Mata is concerned. I can go on, but Kanchan, maybe you should ask the next. Otherwise, I'll just ramble on and on. I wanted to ask you about this point which you make about elitist disdain. You know, the, we are seeing the rise of the unwashed masses in India. Uh, the, you, you, you quote uh, a fictional lady, Lily Chatterjee, uh, has to be a Bengali, uh, who describes Hindu nationalism Hindu did not mean Congress. No, no, please be aware of the distinction. Hindu meant Hindu Mahasabha. Hindu nationalism, Hindu narrowness. It meant rich Baniyas with little education, landowners who spoke worse English than youngest English subdivisional officer his eager but halting Hindi. It meant sitting without shoes and with your feet curled up on the chair, eating, on, eating only horrible vegetarian dishes and drinking disgusting fruit juice. The last bit is for Anand Ranganathan. <laughs> no, but jokes apart, uh, uh, Jokes apart, I don't, I don't think any one of us gathered over here qualifies per this description. But in the vast larger world, this impression stick, still sticks. And one of the challenges is to overcome uh, Th 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 that that kind of pejorative idea of being a Hindu or being a Hindu nationalist. So, Shopun, in your book, you provide a huge selection of reading 
that 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 sort that sort of aims at enabling you to overcome this kind of a a, a, a bigoted view. But beyond that, what does the book try to sort of address? Okay. Uh, uh, firstly, I, th I think it would be fair to point out that that's a passage from a, uh, a writer who's really one of the best chroniclers of the last days of the uh, British Raj in India. And I was really talking about Paul Scott. And this is one of the passages from his his Raj Quartet, you know, I think that this is from Jewel in the Crown, the first one. And uh, uh, if, if you've seen that wonderful serial, which was made by BBC, uh, or was it ITV, I forget, uh, many years ago, and it's, it's, it's a delightful one. It's, it's really one of the masterpieces. Uh, Lily Chatterjee was played by Zora Siegel, and uh, it, it, it was, and you, you can almost sort of imagine, she doesn't say it in the book, but, uh, you can almost imagine this sort of rarefied uh, lady, the widow of a Indian baronet, actually saying it. You know, the the as to explaining why the Hindus weren't allowed into the club, or that sort of Hindus weren't allowed into the club. But it's not that alone. I mean, I'll just quote you another one. Uh, which was written by the Australian High Commissioner to India, a chap called Walter Crocker, who wrote a nice slim assessment and a study of Jawaharlal Nehru shortly after his death, based on sometimes his own experiences. And here he writes, most of Nehru's ministers, like most of the party caucus, were provincial mediocrities, untraveled, ill-educated, narrow-minded, not a few were lazy, some were cow worshippers and devotees of Ayurvedic medicine and astrology, some were dishonest. So you, you, you can see that this is not something which is peculiarly... Uh, and he was reflecting in many ways the... and go... Uh, the the sort of the particular attitude of a Nehruvian elite towards those lesser beings who ultimately had to be accommodated in, into the Congress. Now, I think we had in India various forms of culture wars. And in, you know, if we're talking about culture wars now, I think we, we should realize that these are not something unique again in many ways. That these took place there is a perception of the Indian nationalist movement as being, it's been sort of redefined and restated as being something which probably was an extension of the French Revolution, or at least the non-Jacobian period of it at least. And, uh, and you had the very enlightened souls who, who were rationalists, who questioned everything, God, who questioned organized religion, and who, in other words, were the epitome of today's secularists, not necessarily in an in Indian sense, but in a larger Western sense of the term. And this was the, the belief which has uh, often been put forward. And in that belief, Jawaharlal Nehru stood as the person who epitomized these currents. Um, now, certainly Jawaharlal Nehru occupied a very important role in the Indian nationalist movement, as did many other people who were similarly inclined. But there were two strands of that movement. One was a strand which existed for wider, perhaps, overseas consumption. And another was a strand which existed underneath that, which existed in the provinces. And in the provinces, you had people who were essentially cow worshippers, who were essentially more wedded to Ayurvedic medicine, I mean, Gandhi was another extreme case. He didn't, he, he just loathed modern medicine. 
He just had a pathological disdain for it. And whose attitudes you could, by no stretch of the imagination, be described in today's terms as being rationalist. And that was the reality of India. And so those two existed. And to suppress that, the moment they tried to suppress the other current, you got a reaction. And that's where I think these forces, which were less articulated, less publicized, suddenly found a voice or sought a voice and found it. Gandhi gave them some voice in a tentative way. But Gandhi was also <coughs> more of a person who was somewhat a political leader. He was an ethical, he, he, he was also a religious figure in that sense without being called God. The moral authority which he exercised on India was something stupendous. And I think that's important to recognize that it was that search for that moral authority which really defined it. Not the political authority, but that moral authority which was very, very important. I think if you really look around, now you'd say, is this, therefore, does this make India an exception? I mean, there is a sort of point of view in the world, in, at least in the West, which dates back to sort of Kipling and later Curzon, who was saying that India is an exception. And they were India lovers. I mean, they might have hated a lot of Indians, but they were actually, they had a certain innate fascination for India, particularly Kipling. He was absolutely mesmerized by India. And the idea that, is this something exceptional about India? Are we, are we somehow differently blessed in the world than anywhere else? Perhaps we are. But I think it's also important to recognize that in political terms, the idea of India as Bharat Mata is probably not very different from other depictions of their countries in terms of Britannia, Madeleine. These are not very, very different. Secondly, the belief in that your political beliefs must necessarily relate to the nation. And this Anand was mentioning that, you know, the right has no ecosystem. And I think he, he, he's absolutely right in actually pointing this out. This, this is something. You're not likely to get a right international in the same way as you got the communist international. You're not going to get it. You won't get it. Because there is always that idea that you must look at the national, specific national forces. This is very true of the Conservative Party. This is very true of the sections of the Republican Party. And the belief that ultimately that community wisdom is far greater and has greater efficacy than something which is imposed from the top. This is something which is a prevailing feature not only in India, but elsewhere too. So this is one of the, the big, I mean, one, one of the uh, objectives of this book was to actually say, to point out that this notion of the exceptionalism of the Indian right is not strictly true. Of course, there are certain features which are definitely their own. But there are large currents which you can detect internationally. And within that context, I, I wrote it. Chopin's book also mentions uh, one of those uh, delightful little side stories. N.C. Chatterjee, who was a Hindu Mahasabha 
leader and I think he also won a state assembly election in West Bengal. He won three times member of parliament. And then member of parliament. But he Not was also then member of parliament, he was a very prominent member. He was the father of Somnath Chatterjee. He was the father of Somnath the, Chatterjee. The, the, I mean, I think that's the point which yes. Kanchan is trying to get at. <laughs> so, uh, but Shobhan, if we just telescope into time, you know, uh, much of the impetus to what we today call Hindu nationalism and the world calls Hindu nationalism was the Ayodhya movement, uh, which begins in the late 1980s and then gathers steam. Now, again, the ifs and buts of history, because when the Ayodhya agitation began, the Ram Temple agitation began, uh, it was it was essentially a VHP movement. The RSS was not there. The BJP was not there. And uh, the BJP's adoption of Ayodhya was much later through the Palampur resolution. Uh, no, one often thinks, what if Rajiv Gandhi had played his cards right? And what if VP Singh had not played the Mandal card? Would the Ayodhya agitation still have become a national movement or it would have just fizzled out? And had it fizzled out, would we, would we have seen this, this upsurge of Hindu nationalism, call it Hindu nationalism, call it uh, uh, just nationalism, would, would we still have seen it? Well, I think Kanchan, you gave a rapid read to my book. Uh, because my thesis is completely different. What I have been saying is that Hindu nationalism as a phenomena, as a trend, as a current, existed in India uh, without break right from the time of the 1880s, 1890s. Their inspiration may have even gone back further behind. That's a different matter. But in the modern form as we know it, and it happened without a break. Now, the point which you're talking about is post-independence. No, 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 I'm talking about post-independence. What, what my contention is that, hin that it was not merely the Hindu Mahasabha and the Bharatiya Jansang which were the representatives of Hindu nationalism. There was a very, very important current within the Congress party which was a part of the Hindu nationalism. Do you know today that we get all, I mean, there's a lot of controversy about beef, etc., etc., that most of the legislation, in fact, every single le legislation which exists in the statutes in India were done by Congress governments. Every single one of them. The big, the big cow protection gurus of those times were all important stalwarts of the Congress. What's the name of the person from Jabalpur who used to be the... Um, anyway, most of, most of them were in Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh. You read, the, you read the accounts of the time when the bill was passed in the Uttar Pradesh Assembly. Now the point was that all of this meant that Hindu nationalism as an elect, as a separate electoral force, was not very Im important. It started acquiring momentum in the late 60s when the cow protection movement again took off, and later when the Congress itself started. When Mrs. Gandhi went into her socialist secular phase and started edging out these people post the 1969 split. That's when you had the, the, the that's when you had gradually the need for a separate political voice of these people actually gradually beginning to, to be felt. And the Ayodhya movement should be seen in that context. I believe that the Ayodhya, something resembling the Ayodhya movement would have happened regardless of whether it was the Ayodhya movement or not. Because those forces were yes. looking for expression. So what you mean is that people were looking for a cause? They were looking for a cause. They were looking for a cause. And Ayodhya 
came in at that point because it actually blended a lot of the issues. And it happened at a particular time in the world when you had the Soviet Union crumbling. I mean, it's quite a uh, coincidence that the first big Karseva, Shilanyas in Ayodhya, was done on the same day the Berlin Wall fell. <laughs> it's a curious coincidence, but it's worth sort of keeping that in mind. Uh, it, it, it was certainly, I think if you look back and one of the big chapters I have devoted here is uh, a section by Giril Aljain, you know, a person I respect very much, former Times of India, I mean, father of uh, Sandhya and Minakshi. Uh, but, <coughs> and here he talks about the three pillars of the Nehru establishment and how gradually at a particular time they got demolished and what were the reasons for it. It's worth a read. It's a book which he wrote. Very, in those days, it was seen to be a very daring book. Today, you might see that, okay, a lot of those points have been covered in different discourses. But keep in mind, it was the context in which it was written, the time it was written. And therefore, I think we must look at Hindu nationalism as something as an evolving thing. And one of the points which I wanted to bring out in this whole thing was that the political pedigree if you might want to call it that. The intellectual pedigree of these people go back further. Today, Swami Vivekanand is being reinterpreted in the same way to mean some sort of a Californian godman. You know, he's, he's, he's something, you know, acceptable to everyone. He gives these nice discourses and everyone comes in on a Sunday and sort of says, we are Hindu. <laughs> That you can, you know, maybe there is an aspect of Vivekananda which lends itself to, to that. He certainly had a tremendous uh, aura about him which attracted the exot the believers who, uh, who looked for the exotic. And if you looked at him in the sort of context of USA at the turn of the century, there was a sort of appeal of that very strange everything, the mysterious East had suddenly appeared. So that, I mean, that's one way of look, looking at Swami Vivekananda. But the context in which Vivekananda was perceived within India was as part of a Hindu self-awakening. At a time when people like Lady Lily Chatterjee was talking about, you know, how Hindus are a bit sort of iffy, he sort of said there's a certain pride. And he inculcated that pride, and that pride had to be established by his ability to actually take the message to, to the world. Chopin, we'll, we'll return to Swami Vivekananda in a while. I, what I wanted to talk about is yeah, that... So could, could you interrupt me because I can go off on a Yeah, attention. so... so uh, you, know, you, you referred to... Uh, 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 Bonkim Chattopadhyay's uh, novel, Anandamot, the song in that novel, which, he, uh, which we now know as Vande Mataram, and how that sort of crystallizes the idea of Mother India, uh, Bharat Mata. And then in 1905, Avanindra Nath Thakur, he, he, uh, his uh, composition of uh, Bharat Mata, the but painting, the painting. it's a painting, uh, and, uh, but it's a, it's a very benign Bharat Mata that he presents us in that painting, and I think your book cover also uses that. Um, The song and the painting are conceptually linked, but the ideas are not entirely the same. And second, as Bharat Mata, the idea of Bharat Mata starts then evolving, uh, we have various uh, prints of that era, uh, lithographs, prints, artwork, 
even there was no one idea of Bharat Mata. There was the benign Bharat Mata, there was the militant Bharat Mata, there was the angry Bharat Mata, there was the compassionate Bharat Mata. So how, how does one reconcile these various ideas of Bharat Mata, number one? Number two, since you mentioned Vivekananda, uh, there was also Savarkar with his idea of uh, Punya Bhumi, Matra Bhumi. Uh, so these various strands, how do they mesh together? Well, why do you want them to mesh together? I mean, that's, I think, part, uh, that, 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 that's part of it. To always try and see whether you can make, make them into one. It's not necessarily one. When Bunkim Chandra wrote Vande Mataram, what was his de de what was his depiction? He said, "Tuham Durga Dasha Praharani. It was quite clear. He imagined Bharat Mata to be another manifestation of Durga. Another person, very famous, uh, and he was not the only Bangla writer of those days. Slightly later, another person who used Bharat Mata quite a lot was the, uh, the General Al Roy. Huh? And uh, those in uh, Pondicherry might be familiar with Dilip Kumar Roy, who's his son, who uh, was one of the most accomplished singers of that time and who spent most of his life, was a great friend of Subhash Bose, uh, who spent his life. And, and the General Al Roy had a very different perception. He never tried to actually reduce it to something else. Now, Obanindranath Tagore had this more passive, benign thing. I've used uh, in this a sort of a calendar art, deliberately, a calendar art version of, a very kitschy version of Bharat Mata. And Savarkar set up a Bharat Mata Mandir in Ratnagiri, if I might. I, I don't know whether it still exists or not. Uh, there's another one in Varanasi, which is in a dreadful state at present. Uh, which, uh, but uh, where there was just a map, I think there was just a map of India. Absolutely. Just the map of India. So, people had their, the manner in which it was imagined so was a, by So, people. there was a cultural geography of India, which was Mother India. And there was a political geography of India, which was Mother India. Uh, but there has to be some something, you know, linking up these various ideas that what drove the idea because the idea of the because sacred, Mahabunin the Dhanath idea of the says mother, uh, nationalism uh, no, no, is a religion. No, no, you see, the, uh, uh, Aurobindo, when he came out in his famous Uttarpara speech, spoke about nationalism is Sanatan Dharma, explicit. And Bipin Chandrapal later sort of elaborated on that, that the vision which he got of the mother. Now, the idea that they have to be, their forms have to be similar. The idea was that the motherland was sacred. The motherland had to be worshipped. And in Hindu, there is no one single depiction of what you worship. So it fits in very well. That there is no, in, in, in the sense there is no uniformity, it doesn't have to be a cross. I mean even within, it, it, it can take on various forms or it can be formless. So that to my mind was also very important. So the idea of Bharat Mata is that you regard this as a sacred land. To that extent, even an agnostic stroke atheist like Savarkar was part of that thing. I think where we get into problems with Savarkar is not on the question of Bharat Mata, but on his definition of Hindutva. And I think that's a later, I think tomorrow we are going to discuss that so we can go into all the complexities of uh, Savarkar. In a very interesting de debate, what is very fascinating these days is, I remember when I was a student in the 70s, most of us had never heard of Savarkar. Honestly speaking. And I was a pretty avid student, you know, uh, reader of history, etc. Most of us, for Savarkar did not feature. 
in the in the mid 80s apart from one volume by dhananjay kir on savarkar nothing was available and then it took a quite a lot of doing to actually locate that there were some things in marathi but those of us who couldn't read marathi couldn't get have it yeah, really there, 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 okay that we will pin it down to our so eminent today, historians so i think today one of the things which we have to note is that when we come to a session like this look in the past year the number of books which have been coming out on the similar sort of related themes there have been two biographies of savarkar which have come out there are umpteen political dissections of narendra modi so there is a there is today a need the curiosity of the political context which is where you started off has actually bred people led people to actually probe these things a little more intellectually two quick questions one is is the whole idea of bharat mata and from which you have which you draw the idea of hindu nationalism is it inherently exclusionary in the sense that you are excluding those who would not consider the motherland to be mother or would not want to attach uh, any sacredness to the land two if you are being exclusionary how is that nationalism i don't think necessarily it is there is, there are strands in that body of thought which are definitely exclusionary there are bodies of thought which believe who define hindu in terms of their either their ritual practices or in terms of their what might loosely be called religious beliefs but again that is a problem because what is meant by a religious belief of the hindus there is no such thing there is no uniformity i am a shakta by sort of upbringing to me no puja is really complete without lots of meat <laughs> I mean, the idea of a non-vegetarian puja is—I mean, a vegetarian puja is slightly disturbing. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it is part of the larger pantheon, and I am not going to sort of insist that I have my meat if I go to Varanasi or Hardwar. It's not. the idea of hindu is that one it can be a religious belief it can be a cultural belief and i think in india the dividing lines it's not a sort of great wall of china which divides religion and culture they merge sort of seamlessly into each other which is why the hindu accommodates the nastik you can be an atheist and still be an hindu because it depends on where you are relating in that in that sense the idea of india as sacred geography is something which was also not merely conceptual it was also established as in terms of the pilgrimage routes it's very curious but the pilgrimage routes of india more or less coincide with india's geography so these are issues which have to be now with that the issue which savarkar pointed and i think 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 savarkar one thing about him is that you know he was very brilliant and sometimes he stated positions very bluntly which others had left unsaid and savarkar pointed out one was that he tried to define it in terms of pitribhumi punyabhumi pitribhumi part i think people accepted but it was the punyabhumi that some people say well that's not our holy land then on top of that he said 
and this is not something which he alone said swami vivekananda had said it earlier swami vivekananda put it like that every person leaving the hindu fold is not merely a hindu less but an enemy the more and savarkar sort of said this is conversion is not a change of religion it becomes a change of nationality now these are quite sort of powerful controversial That's the point which i was making that it makes the idea of hindu nationalism exclusionary it doesn't make it uh, an no, all embrace one, one idea. and, and therefore therefore they say you are a nationalist if you are excluding someone no you're not excluding someone what you are saying is that the idea that depends on what is your idea of the hindu that's what i've been trying to say all along that savarkar put it in very very blunt terms which is why he is more contentious whereas others to everything is that india is a nation which predates the constitution of 1950 and that nation has built on an underpinning of what loosely might be called hindu you can find if you find another word for it i'm all willing to go along with 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 it you know if you decide the underpinning i mean atal ji used to say bharatiya but he knew exactly what he was talking about it was exactly the same point the underpinning is hindu tomorrow you light the lamp and who somebody and i i think there are one or two silly people every year who come and say we will not light lamps every year there's a controversy on and that chota mota controversy you know someone in kerala someone in some place or the other but take away those things otherwise can the cultural personality of india is largely defined or largely decided by what can loosely be called hindu this is not to say it's not defined by other inputs also there are other inputs also some of those are completely secular inputs some of these are inputs from other religions etc so in india there is the chalta hai sab chalta hai bhai everything that sab chalta hai it's is is actually quite a very powerful thought yes it is a, a very, very powerful thought. thought also a very hindu thought exactly so sab chalta hai is really what defines indian nationalism with a basic point ki bhai wo sacred bhi hai okay now we will wind up this we'll wind up this first half of the session with something which shopon may think it's a silly question why do you call your book awakening bharat mata uh, why not reawakening bharat mata i mean right well, uh, i mean the word firstly in a book headline reawakening is that, that, that doesn't sound as good as awakening uh, oh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's probably talking. the most compelling thing but I think awakening Bharat Mata. I think there is a lot of people who feel that India is at a very important cusp in its life. That we are either going to redefine, we are going to de define ourselves one more, keeping in mind what we have inherited. That a new India does not necessarily mean a rejection of the old India. and i think that's a very important part where jawaharlal nehru also had a vision of a new india but it if you read his uh, uh, speech at the uh, at the inauguration of the high court in chandigarh where he says i'm so glad i'm so glad this is built on the model of uh, kobusia and it doesn't take into account what existed here in the past I mean that to my mind he saw it that you have to break out of those shackles create a new india and that was a uh, that was an idea which excited a lot of people at that time that india is full of 
superstition. India is full of prejudices. India is full of divisions. And we create this new India, which is, it was, it corresponded to the old sort of some of the Stalinist idea of the socialist man. And you end up with Shastri Bhavan. And you end up with Shastri Bhavan, which I believe should be preserved as the epitome of ugliness. So, uh, just a quick two-minute break while they set up the dais for the next half of the discussion. Please don't go out, have a sip of water or whatever, but we'll start in another two minutes. Thank you. <laughs>